RPA PAL is sponsored by an educational grant from Amgen and we appreciate their support. Finally, be sure to check the RPA website for upcoming webinars and events. I will now turn this over to our moderator, Dr. Lani Paxton. Hello, everybody. Um, first, I'd like to give a brief introduction of myself and my two awesome panelists for today. I'm the COO of Georgia Nephrology here in Atlanta. I'm also a member of the PAL committee and the, work, the CKD work group for RPA. I'm very thankful today for a couple of things. One, our practice for giving us the opportunity to be here and to speak with you. And secondly, to all of the RPA staff who've done an outstanding job in putting together today's presentations for us. I'll be adding today to the list of silver linings of COVID-19. Um, although we aren't gathered um, in person, this virtual opportunity for the exchange of ideas is really welcome at this time. And with that, I'll introduce our two panelists. Um, Dr. William Paxton is a managing partner of Georgia Nephrology. He's a PI for several studies in our research institute. He earned his um, medical degree and PhD at Emory University, where he also did his internal medicine residency fellowship in nephrology, um, and then went on um, to Georgia Nephrology from there. He's the recent former chief of Emory Johns Creek Hospital and a medical director for two DaVita units. My other panelist is Dr. Delphine Tuo. Dr. Tuo is the um, Associate Professor of Medicine at UCSF Division of Nephrology. She's also the Chief Medical Officer for the Ambulatory Specialty Care and Diagnostics Group. She's the Director of UCF Center for Innovation in Access and Quality. She did her undergraduate work at Stanford, her, her medical degree at McGill, her residency and fellowship at UCSF, and went on to achieve a master's in clinical science also at UCSF. With that introduction, I'll turn over the presentation to the other Dr. Paxton, and uh, we'll go from there. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to just thank uh, RPA for asking me to uh, to speak, and um, you know, ho hopefully, this will be a, an interesting session. Um, uh, on this first slide, this is my uh, this is my COVID slide. Um, I think we've all been looking for a barbershop or someplace to get our hair cut. Um, mine was getting so bad that I couldn't stand to see myself on my little video screen in the telehealth. And so my daughter actually cut my hair a couple weeks ago. She did a pretty good job, so it's much more uh, available uh, and acceptable. Um, the other reason that I have this slide is um, that I wanted to, to show the barber pole. And the reason is, um, if we go back hundreds of years, back in the middle of the ages, you know, the barbers were really uh, some of the medical providers. And there is some symbolism to the barber pole with the red and white stripes. Um, you know, the red stripes represent blood from uh, bloodletting or bleeding that they do. And the white is supposed to represent the gauze or the bandages that they use to, to stop the bleeding. And um, at that time, we really didn't have much to offer in terms of other tools of taking care of patients. We did what we could, uh, but, but bleeding was one of the few things that we had. Um, if we jump forward a couple hundred years, um, this is a painting uh, that's in the Dayton Institute of Art. You can see at the bottom, uh, it's titled Washington on his deathbed with the, uh, with the artist. Um, the reason I brought this up here is, um, there's a very interesting story behind uh, Washington's death. And uh, if you have some time or come across it, it, it's worth spending a few minutes to read about. He died on December 14th, um, 1799. Uh, many people feel that he died of a bacterial epiglottitis. Um, in short, he basically woke up with a severe sore throat uh, with progressive difficulty in swallowing and breathing um, until he passed uh, about 12 hours later in the evening. Um, at the time, his care was probably what would have been considered uh, intensive care for 1799. And um, I think based on what was done, if he had an advanced directive, it would have been do everything because they literally did everything that they could. Um, they were still doing bleeding at the time. And uh, President Washington was bled on four different occasions. Um, they've estimated that they've taken that they took out over 80 ounces uh, of blood, uh, something in the order of four to five units. Um, in addition, they had developed some additional uh, tools 
uh, for care. Um, they also did blistering of his throat as well as his extremities later in the day. He was treated with enemas. He was treated with cathartics, enemetics, uh, basically everything that they had. Um, hopefully none of us have to have a, a, a last day, uh, much like the, the president did, um, but that's what they had at the time. They even considered doing a tracheotomy, uh, but the physicians in attendance, uh, after debating this, decided that it was too new and too experimental, um, and so they did not want to pursue that. So if we jump forward a couple hundred years, we go from one former president to another. Um, I think most of you know this guy. If you don't, uh, you should uh, take a chance, an opportunity to get to know him. Uh, this is Dr. Robert Provenzano, um, one of the former presidents of the RPA. Um, I believe he was president in 2005, which was the point that I came out of training and um, had the opportunity to hear him speak several times uh, then and subsequently. And um, he, much like I, probably is not crazy about the telehealth stuff because he wanders around and I feel a little constrained here. Um, but at that time, um, I can remember uh, listening to Bob talk about uh, the transition in medicine. And um, you know, there was all these discussions, oh, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. We're moving from fee for service to pay for performance a value-based uh, reimbursement scheme. And um, as, as he was uh, describing uh, the changes that were coming, um, I remember him saying, look, these changes are coming. We can embrace them. We can try to participate in them. And in doing so, we might have a little bit of say-so over the rules that are gonna come out. He says, or we can stick our head in the sand and they're going to impose the changes on us and we'll be dragged into that uh, kicking and screaming uh, and we will have no say so uh, over, over the changes. And I think that as true as those words were 15 years ago, they're just as true now as we're looking at the uh, different kidney care models. Um, and I think that we have to embrace the fact that we, are, we really should uh, participate as much as we can in the planning and development because it's only going to be to our benefit. Um, the other thing that was occurring at that time was RPA started work on uh, developing a toolbox. Um, and part of the reason I was highlighting different tools that we've had, you know, now we have a whole slew of tools. We've got antibiotics, we've got medications, we've got therapies, and we've got dialysis. Um, as we develop the tools, uh, then people started to say, well, if we're going to pay for outcomes, how are we going to measure how well we're using our tools and our techniques? Um, I would give you the example that um, you could probably buy me a DaVinci robot, which is one of the fanciest tools out there. Um, if you were to measure my outcomes on a DaVinci robot, I'm sure that they would be abysmal. Um, so, you know, we, we have to be um, aware of, of what we want to measure and how. So um, how do we measure our outcomes, our use of the tools that we have? Um, one way that has been sort of in our midst uh, for several years has been core measures. Obviously, there's lots of different ways to measure, and uh, there's some ways to measure these that are moving forward. But I just want to use the core measures as an example. You know, for cardiologists, they're checking on uh, their heart failure patients. Are they being discharged on ACE inhibitor ARB? For us, we're tracked on CVC rates, a whole number of variables that, um, you know, end up in our... Um, uh, CMS uh, star rankings on our dialysis unit and so forth. Hospital lists are tracked on length of stay. So everybody's being measured. Um, some of this has actually resulted in good outcomes. Um, we have moved from the sort of experiential medicine of we see this uh, to much more of an evidence-based medicine, um, which overall has been good. Uh, but with the good, there is probably some downside as well. Um, we have developed protocols, pathways, you know, plans of cares, which I consider both good and bad. Um, when used correctly, they're great. When used unthinkingly, um, we can do better. Um, but the other issue that I think has come out of the, the move towards measurables is that we've gotten overly aware of them and somewhat um, overdriven by them 
to the point where it's really narrowed our focus. Um, the reason I have this picture up here is uh, some people have talked about this concept of siloing. You know, other people talk about well, staying just in your lane. Um, and that's okay if all you're looking at are the things that, that are being measured, uh, but it can lead to sort of a, a, a lack of understanding of how your piece fits in with the others. And if we're really trying to move to a coordinated care picture, um, it, it can be somewhat delirious, De excuse me, deleterious. Um, in this example, this is the very same silo, but you can see that instead of just looking at the silo, uh, we've got a barn, uh, we've got trees, we've got a field, and we've got cows. So this is a very different impression than if all we're looking at is the, the silo. Um, and I would say that when we can look at this, this um, broader landscape, um, maybe as we start to look at the cows, occasionally we might find a zebra. And I think the, the uh, analogy in the, in the medical world is, uh, I think everybody's probably experienced this to one degree or another. A uh, patient comes into the emergency department, they've got three plus edema, ED calls cardiology because it must be heart failure. Cardiology sees the patients, they admit the patient, they diurese the patient. In a day or two or three, edema is better. Um, but lo and behold, their creatinine's gone from one up to 1.7 or 1.8. And so before they send them home, they say, oh, we better call nephrology. So we, we go and see the patient and probably half the time or more, we don't have a urinalysis. And so we get a urinalysis and lo and behold, they've got three plus protein. And we work them up and it turns out that they've got some sort of a nephrotic syndrome or something else. And that really wasn't heart failure in the first place. Um, but if all you're looking as a cardiologist is, how much edema is there? Well, of course it must be heart failure. Um, so I, I think that uh, my point is that if we're going to coordinate the care and take the best care of the patient possible, we really need to begin to move away from the progressive narrowing that's occurred over years and start to rebroaden uh, our view of the patient as a whole. Um, I'm going to move on uh, to a poll, and I want to just give a little bit of guidance before I get there so you don't start just punching. Um, there's four issues, um, and I want you to answer as many of these that you actively manage as possible. Okay, so um, these, are, uh, these are the poll questions. Are you actively managing hypertension, anemia, gout, or diabetes? And, and by anemia, I really mean um, are you... Do you have a uh, anemia management protocol? Do you have an anemia manager? Are you actively managing this? If so, yes. If you are sending your patients out to hematology, then the answer should be no. So let me give you just a, a chance for that. And if you are not a provider, but you're a, uh, a practice administrator, uh, feel free to answer on behalf of what you think your uh, favorite doc would answer for these. We don't wanna leave anybody out. Okay, so here are the results, as expected. Hypertension 100%. And I put this on here as a gimme, but I have to say I was rounding in one of my dialysis units a month or so ago, and I saw a patient, uh, my nurse practitioner had written a note and said, um, hypertension, uh, blood pressure uncontrolled, refer to car cardiology. So I stopped rounds immediately. I got on the phone, I said, um, hey, we're the ones who are managing the hypertension in this patient. Um, I'm glad to see that that's 100%. Anemia, again, I think this is something that's been bread and butter in the nephrology world. Again, I'm glad to see that most of us are managing these things. Um, gout, uh, again, I'm amazed at how much gout we see in our CKD population. Uh, and there's data out there that as we um, you know, treat hyperuricemia, uric acid, sometimes we get better outcomes in terms of the kidneys, so that's good. And then diabetes. And I, I really kind of want to spend just a minute and, and talk about diabetes um, because I used to get very frustrated that I would see my diabetic patients, my diabetic CKD patients, and I would uh, basically forward them on to endocrinology. And you know, when the SGLT2 inhibitors came out, I'd say, hey, you know, this patient has some, hyper, uh, some proteinuria, you know, maybe we can do a little bit better. I think an SGLT2 inhibitor would benefit them but I would leave that to the endocrinologist. And uh, then the patient would come back and see me in three months, four months, six months, whatever. And it seemed like they never got put on any of the therapies that I was suggesting. And um, so I, I heard a talk uh, at RPA a couple of years ago 
uh, one of the, uh, endo the president of the Endocrinology Society, and he was talking about the lack of, of endocrinologists taking care of diabetes. So I was just curious, currently the latest data that I could find, there are about 100 million patients that have either diabetes or prediabetes, meaning that they're expected to become uh, overtly diabetic within two years, um, or uh, there's about 30 million patients who are already diabetic. Now, there are only about five to 6,000 endocrinologists, and there's a, a large, portion of them that aren't even managing diabetes. So let's just make the numbers just for, for calculations. Like let's, let's look at 5,000 uh, endocrinologists um, at even just the 30 million diabetics that are out there, that's 6,000 per provider, per physician. And if you were to look at the whole broad spectrum of 100 million diabetics and prediabetics, that's like 20,000 uh, per physician. Now I recognize a lot of these are cared for by their primary care and so forth, but um, I would hopefully, maybe that's gonna open some eyes because it really did for me when I recognized that there were these lack of, of uh, diabetic uh, providers in the endocrinology world. I mean, for example, we've got a little over 10,000 nephrologists, I believe. So we've got twice as many and we have less patients. So they really have an order of magnitude higher. Um, but I think as a result, what that's meant to me is when I see these patients and I think, boy, they'd benefit by being on an SGLT2 inhibitor, I'm gonna go ahead and put on it, put them on it, and be a little bit more aggressive about actually helping to manage diabetes in our patients. And you know, why is that important? Well, if you, um, I think, here, just see, if I go back, if you look at the, um, at the four things, you know, if I were to, to fully silo, and I'm seeing this patient for CKD, and I send them for a cardiologist, for hypertension, um, a hematologist for anemia, a rheumatologist for gout, and an endocrinologist for diabetes management, they're going to five docs. That's not a very efficient uh, use of our medical resources when for the most part, all of these things are uh, really associated to their, their kidney disease in, in uh, generally a pretty large way. So um, let me see if I can move to the last slide. Uh, Okay, here we go. Um, so to kind of wrap up, um, I just like everybody to see the big picture. Um, you know, move away from that very narrowed uh, sort of specialty focused and, and, and look at the big picture. So we're not missing things that, that are almost obvious. Um, second thing is do what's best for your patient. You know, part of what's happening is these CKD patients are being attributed to us. They are our patients. So we really need to try and do the best. And I'm not saying like, for example, I had a patient recently that was diagnosed with Schmidt syndrome, which is an autoimmune destruction of like all of the endocrine organs. That's not a patient that we're trying to take care of. That really is an endocrine patient. But the, the sort of garden variety, you know, bread and butter diabetes that we can help with. Uh, go ahead and take a little bit of, uh, of ownership of that patient. And then communicate, communicate, communicate. And, and by that, I mean, we got to communicate with the patients. If we spend just, just a minute and teach them how their, di um, their diuretics work or teach them a little bit about what's going on, we can empower them to take better care of themselves. And, and they understand. Um, it, communicate to the patient's families, you know, oftentimes they're helping with medications, things like that. There are tools, you know, clinical summaries that can go to the patient families and really help to make sure that, that they're being cared for the way we intend. And communicate with our colleagues, our referring providers and our other colleagues, you know, think about how we're uh, giving the information back to them. You know, I can write, start lisinopril 10 milligrams daily. That's not very effective. But if I said, I want to start this patient on uh, uh, an ACE inhibitor for renal protection and to minimize their proteinuria, then somebody else is going to think twice about stopping that medication. They understand what I'm trying to achieve. So um, I, I would say look for ways to expand your toolbox. Again, RPA has, some, has a lot of resources, but I think that there are things that we can develop on our own uh, to help expand. Um, medicine is changing. It always has. We're not doing bleeding anymore. Uh, we're not doing these other things. And the change always is gonna happen. So I think rather than, than hide from it or run from it, we need to engage it and, and, and help 
uh, you know, steer the change the way we want. Um, and with that, I think I'm going to finish and pass on to my colleague, uh, Delphine Tuo, uh, and she's going to give you some more specifics on uh, ways that we can help to coordinate care. Great, thank you. So I just want to uh, take the opportunity to thank the RPA for uh, elaborating on tools that we can use to try to enhance primary care and nephrology collaboration, really building on many of the concepts that Bill just discussed. So this is just a conceptual framework that I like to use when thinking about primary care specialty care collaboration. We have clearly a group of, we have a shared approach and a shared desire of a quality metrics to take care of our patients. Many of them are applicable to all of our patients. And as Bill mentioned, many of them may just be applicable to a certain subset of our patient population. So we have to think about which quality metrics to use. But the idea is that they are a shared, they are shared. And there are things that primary care providers can and should do to try to improve collaboration, and improve communication with us as nephrologists. But then on the specialty care side, there are a variety of things and tools that we can use to better enhance communication with our primary care colleagues and really enhance collaboration. And so I just want to take the next 15 to 20 minutes to highlight maybe five of those tools. I'm not going to go necessarily in depth in any one of them, but I wanted to show them here so that you all had access to them and can look at them in greater detail. The first two really are squarely in our space. So a CKD registry that identifies chronic kidney disease and helps discuss management strategies and reminds primary care providers of those. I wanna talk briefly about various telenephrology tools to increase our reach and help communicate and help see patients uh, remarkably in rural areas where there may not be a sufficient nephrology care to really help our primary care colleagues with those patients and then talk a little bit about tools for strictly for communication strategies. So e-consults, a variety of written communication tools that are in the RPA toolkit and a transfer of care template. So let me start by talking about a CKD registry. Um, as many of you know, CKD disease registries identify patients with a disease and highlight the quality gaps that might as exist for that particular patient or that subgroup of patients. And I just wanna give you one example where a chronic disease registry was particularly helpful. I work in a public healthcare delivery system. And in our system, our nephrologist took the lead and created, developed a CKD registry in collaboration with some of our primary care colleagues and for use really in primary care. But we took the lead because we recognize that most, primary, most uh, CKD is delivered in primary care settings. And many of our primary care providers don't identify patients with chronic kidney disease actively. So this registry that sits on top of our electronic health record really identifies those patients that have CKD. And then at point of care, so at the visit itself, it creates alerts to let primary care providers know that yes, this person in front of you has kidney disease, this is uh, what the latest UACR is, these are the medications that you should consider prescribing if not already prescribed. These are not mandated, but these are recommendations, again, to better try to encourage application of guideline therapy for these early, uh, for these patients with early CKD. And this was particularly helpful for patients who are being seen in primary care, as well as in nephrology care, but really in primary care, either via telehealth or via in-person. But this was much less helpful for those patients with CKD that are floating out in the periphery and never actually make it to primary care. And so this, this registry also identified all the patients with chronic kidney disease who hadn't been seen in primary care in the last 18 months and provided quarterly feedback to those primary care teams that identified which one of those patients did not have blood pressure control, which ones were not on an ACE or an ARB yet had proteinuria, which ones had lots of had macroalbuminuria or macroproteinuria that had not yet been minimized. And the idea of this was to really leverage the primary care team, so the medical assistants, the nurses, any nurse practitioners, to try to offload some of the work from the primary care providers. Again, recognizing that CKD is uh, challenging for many primary care providers and they have lots of other things on their plates. So this was our way to try to uh, teach them or try to provide uh, recommendations for the entire team to participate. 
And as you can see here, the graph on the right hand side, you have adjusted odds ratio uh, uh, on, in your y axis. And you can see that among all of the patients with chronic kidney disease, those that were randomized to have a registry, so the patients whose primary care teams had access to this registry, had higher odds of receiving an ACE ARB prescription. Um, as well as higher odds of albuminuria quantification. So our registry was actually positive in an improved care for our patients in, er, with early chronic kidney disease. Interestingly, it did not improve blood pressure control, which just goes to show how challenging it is to uh, control blood pressure in our CKD patients, but that might be a topic for another day. But it does highlight the importance of collaboration with primary care and the ability for primary care providers to, to deliver a lot of chronic kidney disease care with, uh, with help from their nephrology colleagues. And so registries are particularly helpful in closed systems such as where I work or systems that have established networks where you can really identify your population of patients and those who have chronic kidney disease. I think they may be a little harder to implement in groups that are in areas that are much more uh, siloed in practice and don't have shared patients. But these telenephrology tools can actually be applied in a variety of different delivery systems, and they really improve our reach in a high quality, equitable way. There was a recent uh, review article published in AJKD just last month, I think, that highlights how nephrology can be used to increase our reach. And they highlighted five different tools in particular. This first one is called CVT or clinical video visits, essentially the telehealth that you heard quite a bit about earlier today. They highlighted e-consultation. So electronic consultation is where a primary care provider sends a request or a question to a specialist. That specialist can then answer that question and there's no expectation that the patient will necessarily be seen in the specialist visit or in the specialist office. And this idea is again to provide uh, more collaboration and more communication with our referring providers. Scan Echo is something similar, but it's more done on a group setting. So Scan Echo is a provider to provider uh, video conferencing mechanism that connects primary care providers primarily in remote areas with specialists in more urban or more academic centers. And the idea is to create a virtual in real time conference where you can present your cases and your specialist, your nephrologist can answer um, their recommendations for your complex cases. And it really promotes case-based learning for the primary care providers who may be out on their own in the community. These last two um, telenephrology tools are really web-based tools that are meant for patient education. And these, are, uh, these, are, these include low literacy written tools or low literacy PDFs that can be printed out as well as videos and other uh, media to try to engage patients understanding in their, uh, their chronic kidney disease and the complications thereof. And with the exception of this first office-based uh, clinical video visit, all four of these others can really occur outside of the traditional provider to patient encounter and thus allows us to extend our reach into the primary care community. And so with that, I wanted to launch the first poll. And the poll question is, in which of the following telenephrology modalities have you or a member of your group participated to deliver clinical care? And I'd like you to choose any that you have participated in, say in the last year. Is it clinical video visit? Is it e-consultation? provider to provider conferencing for in real time discussion about complex cases or web based nephrology education for your patients. So I'll wait for a minute so that we can see the, the results of the, of the poll. Excellent. So thank you. So these are interesting. So as we have seen earlier today, many of our many of the participants and many of us have participated in clinical video visits or telehealth directly with our patients. Um, about a third have done e-consults, which is great and something I'm going to talk just a little bit more about, a provider to provider conferencing, and many of us have used a web-based nephrology education, so that's great. And for the few of you that have not done any or participated in any of these tools, I would highly encourage you to do so. And so I just wanna spend a few moments really highlighting the e-consult workflow because I do feel like this is something that many of us can participate in and really has the greatest potential to enhance collaboration with our primary care providers. 
For those of you that are not uh, aware of e-consults or how the workflow essentially functions, it's such that a primary care provider or any referring provider discusses a diagnosis with their patient. They send an e-consult question to a specialist. Many uh, people across, many providers across the United States use third-party platforms in order to do this that are independent of any one electronic health record. There are also e-consult modalities that are embedded in some of the most common electronic records, electronic health records that are used in the US. So either one can be used effectively. The primary care provider places that e-consult, the specialist, in this case the nephrologist, reviews the e-consult and then answers the question. And usually these are questions that are, they are patient specific, um, and the, but it doesn't often require a in-person visit with the specialist. These can, you know, the specialist can provide anticipatory guidance, can provide learning, can provide recommendations for next steps in terms of diagnostic tools. And then they and so the specialist then replies to the primary care provider in on this secure electronic platform. And that e-consult can then be in can then be implemented in primary care and the primary the primary care provider follows up with the patient and care goes on in the primary care home. So this saves an unnecessary visit um, to the specialist office. Many of the times, however, the specialist replies with recommendations on next steps, on diagnostics, on what to do for a workup. Say three plus proteinuria, how do you work up nephrotic syndrome? And so then the primary care provider can complete that workup prior to the patient then being seen for a face-to-face -face visit or a telehealth visit with the specialist. And then the specialist continues on with the care of that patient. And e-consults are efficient in that they are asynchronous. They're outside of the regular, tel of the, um, regular visit with your patient panels. And primary care providers can complete or send e-consults outside of their traditional office visits as well. So we can really fit it in within our day-to-day -day lives, both on the referring provider side and the specialist side. E-consults also now have CPT codes and they are reimbursable by Medicare in many private plans. I think Medicaid plans, depending on your state, they are starting to consider reimbursing them as well. So they do provide some remuneration. And importantly, they foster collaboration between the specialist and the referring provider, particularly if both of those individuals are local. If they're not local, they foster more virtual relationships or virtual collaboration. And importantly, these are really well received by our primary care providers. E-consults in multiple different studies, um, including this one, but not limited to the study that I'm presenting here, have shown that e-consults are well received, are thought to be educational by primary care providers and help uh, keep patients in primary care as much as possible. This is a study that was published in 2017 that looked at a multi-system e-consult program and asked primary care providers, how has e-consult implemented or impacted your ability to manage any of these conditions in the past year? And you can see by the large percentage of the green graphs, the green bars, that most primary care providers felt that the e-consult responses helped them in their learning and helped them in their management. The idea being that the next time they refer to nephrology or any other specialty, the workup will be that much further along and uh, will be more efficient. And so I just wanna move on to a couple other community communication tools that can be used. Um, the RPA had created a toolkit many years ago that uh, perhaps ahead of its time, I will say, but really um, identified items that can be used to improve communication between the referring provider, the primary care provider often, and the specialist. And the ones that I find most helpful for me are these concise guidelines that you can provide, that as nephrologists we can provide to primary care providers. The guidelines probably need to be updated since the last time, but um, but uh, these really provide anticipatory guidance and, and uh, guidelines or recommendations to primary care providers for basic chronic kidney disease complications and why, and really provides an explanation as to why we do what we do. Why do we prescribe the ACE inhibitor? Why do we titrate it up? Why do we recommend an SGLT2 inhibitor, et cetera? And the post-consult letter we are all quite familiar with. And so I just wanna do one other quick poll and just get a sense 
Um, does your practice or any other practice use, uh, well, that's okay. Yep. Does your practice use any type of template or tool to communicate with your referral sources, including local primary care providers? And then after that, I just want to identify one more tool that can be helpful. Let's see what the, uh, what the poll results show. Great. So almost two thirds of us actually do use some type of template or tool to communicate with our referring sources. And um, this is impressive. And I think we can continue to use these tools and refine them to do a better job at communication. They may not feel like rocket science to us, honestly, but they are really important in that they codify our thinking and our explanations to our primary care providers. Nothing is more frustrating to receive a consult letter back without a clear understanding of why that physician or why that specialist did what she did and why she chose the management strategy that she has chosen. I myself have felt very uh, frustrated by that when I've received consult letters back from other specialists. And so this is the last tool that I just wanted to highlight, and this is a transfer of care template. Many, some of our patients that once we've seen, we've managed, their CKD is very stable, and they probably don't need to necessarily see us any longer. If you're in a situation where you have a supply demand mismatch and that the wait times to get into your clinic, they're quite long and you have that, uh, that ability, excuse me, you have that opportunity to send stable patients back to primary care, this is just one example of a transfer uh, template. And the idea just being that it again is um, templated so that you can provide very clear anticipatory guidance and importantly, really uh, tell your primary care providers when they should re-refer to you um, so that the patient doesn't get lost and doesn't just stay in primary care forever. So with that, I will follow up, finish up and just highlight again what Bill had said, said earlier and that communication is really the key to successful coordination and just really uh, finish off with this, uh, this shared approach or this conceptual model that I like to, to recommend thinking about. And with that, I will stop. Thank you so much, Dr. Tuo and Dr. Paxton. Um, both of you, those were very insightful comments. Um, I had noted in the chat box um, for um, our attendees that both of you practice in an urban or suburban kind of area and to think about how that might, um, how your comments might be adapted into sort of a rural or a um, smaller practice setting. Um, I would encourage anybody who wants to weigh in on that to do so. Um, I haven't seen anything quite yet. Uh, there was the other piece that Dr. Paxton brought up with me um, before was that we, we've really focused our comments today on nephrology leadership in terms of referrals and in terms of um, sort of the day-to-day -day management of patients. One other area that's come up from time to time is care management within the, within the practice setting and specifically the dedication of somebody as a care coordinator for sort of the late stage or folks who are progressing to um, dialysis. Um, and I thought I'd take just a quick second to comment on that. Um, within our group, we do actually have a care coordinator, and for a period of time, that position became vacant. Our experience, um, to go back to what has been said in other portions of today's presentation, was that we were able to drive home therapies almost up to a 50% penetration rate when we had a care coordinator in place. And when we lost her, uh, we sort of went trendling right back down to where we had been in that 10 to 15 percent range um, and we're hopeful having restaffed to be able to bring that back up to speed. I didn't know if either of you might want to comment briefly on that on care coordination or sort of that care coordinator type position in terms of a leadership position for nephrology. Delphine you want to go first or do you want me to comment? Uh, why don't you go ahead and then I'll piggyback off of, the, off of you. So, um, you know to, to just sort of fill out a little bit about what, what Lonnie um, brought up. Um, you know, we had a patient, or a, I'm sorry, a provider in this role who was, was uh, working to help with transitions, uh, both to dialysis, you know, having somebody to sort of hold their hand along the way, um, or through the transplant process. And they also helped coordinate to make sure that the patients were getting their, their CKD education, 
to get their access, to go to their appointments. They would call them and say, hey, you've got an appointment coming up tomorrow with Dr. So-and-so for your access surgery. Because what we were finding was that all too often the patients would conveniently forget about their appointment or come up with some other reason that things weren't getting done. We also, um, in terms of the education part, um, really felt like most of the programs that were out there weren't um, adequate. So we sort of brought that in-house, do it with our nurse practitioners to tailor it specifically to the patient. But I think um, just to give an example where this was such an important piece, I've got a patient who is now, I believe, 62. He had a kidney transplant, which is now 25 years old. It was a deceased donor, but it was a perfect match. Um, he's working full time as a FedEx delivery man, and he's reliably at the top of, you know, his his uh, measures in terms of, of deliveries and things like that. Um, he was sent down to. We've got two transplant systems in Atlanta. He was sent down to one where he'd had his previous transplant years and years ago, um, and they scheduled him for all of these tests. Um, but they really didn't communicate well on how and when they were supposed to happen. And so when he would get a call the day before and say, you're supposed to be here for an echo, or you're supposed to be here for uh, you know, a CT scan, well, he was scheduled to work the next day. He couldn't change in, in a dime. And so they labeled him as being non-compliant. Now, again, he's got a 25 year history of taking care of a transplant. He clearly can take care of his kidney and he's working full time. But I think that, and this all occurred in the setting between our coordinators. And I think that if we had had a coordinator in position there, they could have been aware because they keep track of the, the patient's appointments and help them through the process. Um, and I think that's just one example of, of, of where I think we could have had a better outcome. You know, now he's starting the process again with our other transplant system because I think the, the water has been poisoned a little bit with, with the first one. Unfortunately, it looks as if we may have lost Dr. Tuo. So I'm going to um, I'm going to ask the one question that's come in and, and ask you to weigh in on that. And if she's able to rejoin us, we'll continue from there. Um, the question says, obesity is associated with hypertension, diabetes, and gout. If a patient is obese, what is your opinion on nephrologists addressing obesity with patients? Um, great point. Um, we see tons of obesity, especially um, down here in the south, because in addition to being the diabetes belt and the, the stone belt, I think it's also the fat belt too. Um, but um, it, as you said, it plays a role in almost everything that we do. And um, so I think that it's important for us to address that with the patient. I think that it's important to reinforce when they are trying to lose weight that they actually have, you know, if I see that they've lost five pounds or 10 pounds, continue to reinforce that. I think that it's useful to help refer them to resources. I don't think it's necessarily our job to prescribe a diet for them, et cetera, et cetera. But it's always been amazing to me um, how big an impact it has when we as a physician tell someone, you need to do this, you need to lose weight, you need to stop smoking, et cetera. Um, and I, you know, in practicing for 16 years, the number of patients that come back and say, hey, you know, doc, I'm so glad I stopped smoking five years ago and I, I really appreciate that you, you told me I needed to because it, 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 sometimes it's just hearing the right message and the right words and I think that that's what our role is in terms of helping the obese and overweight patients. All right. Well, thank you. I believe that that brings us to the end of our session. Um, thanks to everybody who's attended. And thank you to both you and Dr. Tuo for your excellent presentation today. Thank you. I'd like to echo uh, Dr. Paxton's thank yous. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, we know it's been a busy and informative day so far, so we appreciate you sticking with us. Um, so it sounds, it seems like uh, Dr. Tuo may have had a tech glitch and got lost at the very end there, but um, we really appreciate all the, the thoughts and uh, insights that you both have provided. Um, and with that, I'm going to suggest that everyone close out of this Zoom. Um, you can either go back to the conference website or to your email to launch the next, excuse me, the next session, which will begin in five minutes. Again, thank you.